Good afternoon. We'll be reading quite a range of books and articles and different pieces of scholarship across a number of disciplines, including philosophy and political science and sociology. So today's um, material, this slideshow, is intended to give you kind of an overview of what the central line of argument is. What I would define as the central dilemma of this course is the apparent tension that exists between the values and the institutions of liberal democracy and the challenge which is being advanced by radical right-wing populists all over the world challenging those central values. Liberalism, both classic liberalism and contemporary liberalism, celebrates the rights of the individual, rights including liberty of conscience, liberty of speech and association, freedom of thought. And democracy denotes a system of government in which people have ultimate political authority and legitimacy. Of course, there are different ways in which a democracy might be institutionalized. Our democracy is a representative democracy. The idea of a liberal democracy combines the value commitments of liberalism with the commitment to the idea that the people should rule. And so those central commitments of liberal democracy include the rule of law, equally and impersonally applied, institutions which are devoted to the preservation of the rights and liberties of all individuals, and institutions of politics, including voting, legislation, presidency, that empower all citizens equally. So the central question that we're raising in this course is whether these ideas, which come straight from political philosophy and political theory, but also from our own constitutional history, are these ideas socially compatible? Put it a different way, is modern liberal democracy stable? Can the institutions and democratic values that we espouse, can those values and institutions serve to maintain the workings of democracy in the face of efforts to undermine or replace democratic institutions? Can a liberal democracy based on equality and liberty maintain itself in an environment of hate? The present challenge to liberal democracy is the rise of radical populist politicians and parties all over the world. Democratic institutions, democratic governments are being challenged by radical populists, by politicians, parties, and followers who simply do not accept the key values of democracy. And so those parties often organize themselves around hatred of immigrants, hatred of other religious groups, often hatred of racial and ethnic groups, and specifically seek to divide the national population along racial or ethnic lines. And then political mobilization of movements occurs and uh, political parties emerge, which are organized around these kinds of nationalist divisions and hatreds. And this is not simply in other countries. Uh, this kind of populism and division and hatred is also found in our own history and frankly in our own contemporary politics. But in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, the Ku Klux Klan, um, various movements which were anti-Catholic, anti-Semitism, more recently anti-immigrant um, hostility, anti-Muslim bigotry, we're all familiar with the, po the political appeals which have been um, the basis of mobilization of sometimes fringe parties and sometimes um, mass political parties in our country. And these parties, these movements, these radical populist movements are unified in rejecting some of the key values and key commitments of liberal democracy. In particular, they 
are very willing to undermine the key institutions of democracy, including the judiciary and the systems of voting rights, which ensure that every citizen can vote. They specifically and deliberately exploit intergroup animosities to energize their followers. Increasingly in Europe and now in the United States, these parties and these movements tolerate violence and intimidation, armed militias, guns at rallies, and these movements are inclined to embrace racist language, the symbols of white supremacy, bigotry against Jews, Muslims, Mexican people, people of color. Where do these movements of radical populism point? Where are they heading? It would seem that they're heading towards illiberal democracy authoritarian rule by elected strongmen. And we have examples of these kinds of governments in Turkey, in Brazil, in Russia, in India, and in many, many other countries around the world. These governments, these illiberal democracies, are marked by a disregard of the institutions of the judiciary, of constitution, of law, a disregard of the equality and the rights of minorities, and by a marked antagonism to the free press and to independent journalism. So why are democracies vulnerable to this kind of mobilization? Why is anti-democratic mobilization possible within a democracy? Well, I think we can identify some features of our own society, but it's true also in other countries and in Europe, um, features which kind of understandably lead to discontent among large pieces of the population. So the fact of severe and increasing inequalities in our country and in other countries, in Great Britain, um, a perceived lack of economic and social opportunities the fear that one's children will not have better lives than one has been able to make for him or herself. Um, the idea that more powerful agents are making the important decisions so that democracy is in some sense a sham. The fear that globalization and international trade is reducing our national and our individual life prospects and freedoms. And finally, a kind of cynicism about democratic politicians the idea that politicians are in it for their own advantage, they're not serving the people. But there's another important question, and that is, what are the um, ways in which people's discontent is mobilized into action and into adherence to a hate-based party? How does hate-based mobilization occur? And uh, in this slide, I, I suggest a kind of a simple model where a population is subject to many different kinds of influences. Um, I refer to them here as divisive catalysts and inclusive catalysts against a background of various standing conditions of economic hardship, war sometimes, um, fear of terrorism uh, has been an important factor in this country and in Europe, and a sense of cultural instability. So those might be standing conditions. And then depending on how things go in the population, either a politics of hate emerges or a politics of harmony and social cohesion. And I think it's, it, it's one of the topics in this course, but for us as citizens, it's hugely important for us to figure out how do these processes, how does this process of mobilization and the social psychology of hate. Actually work. There's an important idea that we can take from other areas of the human sciences. It's the idea of resilience. And I would like to ask you to be thinking about the question, how can our democracy and how can our society become more resilient to the kinds of shocks which are producing hate-based movements and really, frankly, a kind of fascism 
emerging in many parts of the world today. How does the idea of resilience apply to communities? And in particular, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious communities around the world. Shocks happen in every community, a police killing, um, a theft, um, a violent crime in a community, an incendiary speech, a labor crisis. And it is possible for any of these events to generate um, conflict and possibly violence. And so the question is, what kinds of features of community life, community local organization permit a multi-group community to retain its stability and its intergroup harmony? And what we know from the history of ethnic violence, for example, in India, which we will spend a little bit of time on later in the semester, that um, ethnic violence is not just an accidental thing. It is um, produced by political entrepreneurs and it can be resisted by community organizations, Hindu Muslim associations, for example, in India, which have the capacity to be more resilient in the face of provocation. So it does seem that maybe one part of the answer to the question, how can a democratic multi-ethnic society be more stable is the possibility that cross group organizations and partnerships may have a kind of um, integrative um, effect for the different groups in society and may therefore be supportive of um, democracy. So as we move towards the later part of the semester, we'll be asking ourselves the question, what are the conditions of stability in a democracy? And I offer a couple of different ideas here. But uh, first, um, if a society had a broad consensus that all members of society are treated fairly, if there were a broad consensus about fair treatment, if there were a confidence in a high level of equality of opportunity in social, political, and economic positions. And everyone has a reasonably equal shot at, at moving into the desired positions in society. If there were confidence that government institutions are reasonably honest and transparent, if there were confidence that private influence does not unduly affect the content and application of laws and regulation, and if there were an abiding and overriding conviction that we are one society consisting of many communities and that the well-being of all depends on the contributions and fair treatment of all. If we had such an effective interlacing of communities through cross-cutting political, social, and economic organizations, then perhaps we would have greater stability. What are the conditions of a resilient democracy and the political institutions of a democracy? Well, if there were a broad spread recognition of the legitimacy of government itself, we as a people do not seem to agree about the legitimacy of government uh, at the moment. If there were a broad recognition that we're all committed to the rule of law, we're all committed to the rights of association, speech, religion, movement, thought, expression, and committed to the equal rights and worth of all members of the community. So no one has to feel anxiety that his or her rights will be disregarded. If we were confident that we possess a compassionate regard for the lives and the flourishing of members of other communities, it is a, an appealing idea about our multicultural world to imagine a mixed community which embodied these commitments the recognition of the rule of law, the commitment to the equal rights of all members of the community and a compassionate regard for the lives and flourishing of all members of the communities. Are there strategies which can be pursued to strengthen our own democracy, our democracy here in the United States, or for that matter in Germany or France or the Netherlands? We could ask the question, is civic engagement part of the answer? 
Are grassroots organizations part of the answer? Are these cross-community partnerships and collaborations, which I was just speaking of, part of the answer? More generally, can we enhance social cohesion and the stability of democracy through these means and thereby strengthen democracy? And finally, do we need to have a new kind of civic education for young people about the serious and important values that we espouse in our democracy? That's pretty much an overview of the issues that we'll be considering. And I think you'll find the material that we read and discuss in this course um, in pursuit of these various questions, tremendously interesting.